Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Nicole, and on today's episode, we're talking about one of my favorite topics, sleep. We all know how important sleep is for our health and our functioning, but in my experience, sleep issues are one of the most overlooked and underappreciated factors when it comes to challenges and symptoms that kids might be experiencing. Whether we're talking about attention, anxiety, mood, learning, behavior, or anything else, the research is really clear that sleep plays a major role for kids. And I've been hoping for a long time that somebody would write a book about this, not just about how to get kids to sleep, because there's lots of books on that, but why it's so important, all the ways it can go wrong, and most importantly, what we can do to help with these sleep issues in kids. And now, Dr. Chris Winter has written it. And so I'm thrilled to have him on the show today to delve into all things sleep with us. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He's a neurologist and double board certified sleep specialist who sees children and adults in his sleep clinic. He's been involved in sleep research and science since 1992. In addition to his clinical work, he serves as the sleep specialist for many professional sports organizations, including the 2020 World Series champion Los Angeles Dodgers. Yay. He's the author of the critically acclaimed The Sleep Solution, Why Your Sleep is Broken and How to Fix It, a book that New York Magazine named the best book on insomnia in 2018. He's also the author of the recently released book, The Rested Child, Why Your Tired, Wired, or Irritable Child May Have a Sleep Disorder and How to Help. I have been waiting to do this interview. So excited to have you here. Welcome to the show, Dr. Winter. Thank you, Nicole. You can call me Chris if you like. Awesome. So great to have you here. I would love to just start out by having you share with our listeners how you became interested in sleep. I mean, you trained as a physician, but what got you so invested in sleep? It was kind of accidental. I mean, when I was in an under, when I was an undergraduate student, I had a plan to become a physician. Um, but I wasn't really sure exactly what I was interested in pediatrics, but I was also kind of interested in surgery and dermatology and, you know, it's easy to decide you're going to be a doctor when you, you you have no idea what's going on. You know, both my parents were school teachers. So it was just sort of this idea. And so when I got to the university of Virginia, my advisor said, you should maybe do some research with some doctors and, and see, you know, what they do. And if you like it, it'll give you something to put on your resume or whatever. And so I started working with this guy named Paul Surratt, who ran the sleep center at the University of Virginia and just a wonderful friend and mentor. And I thought this is the coolest field. You know, we were doing sleep research on pigs and and doing all these great, you know, protocols. And so I never really intended it to be a career. But then when I went to medical school down at Emory, I started working with the sleep doctors down there, Don Blywise and Dave Rye. And so I just never left the field. It was always like, well, I'll just do this to earn some money for takeout on Friday night and get some, you know, something to put on my resume. But at some point I will go on and become this other thing. And at some point I was like, what am I, you know, I've been in the field for 12 years. Am I just going to leave and just not do it anymore? And so it's, it's a great field full of really, really kind people and, and encouraging. And I think we all kind of feel like you said that it's sort of, an ignored thing. And so we all kind of have this shared, you know, this idea of we've got to get good information out there about sleep and and help people kind of figure it out. And it's probably more true than ever. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think absolutely. Especially after the last, you know, 18 months or so. Um, I do think it's one of the things that people don't professionals and, um, parents don't really appreciate enough in terms of the impact that it has on kids. I mean, you know, sort of inherently we know, oh yeah, sleep is important or you know, even adults. So many people are walking around sleep deprived and going, ah, you know, I'll deal with my sleep at some point. And, and I really think we have lost an appreciation for how much sleep does for us and really what the impacts are that we're experiencing, even as adults from not getting good quality sleep. Even when I start talking with adults about that, they just sort of think, well, this is just how I function now or how I feel now. And it's like, but I wonder how that would be different if you actually slept at night. You know, I mean, I just don't think that we really appreciate the the role that it plays for us. No, it's absolutely true. I mean, I don't think that we're particularly good as a collective at identifying things that operate slowly. 
mm. you know, a, a migraine or a heart attack gets everybody's attention and, and really scares people. But something that quietly eats away at something is is sort of a different story. And um, you know, there are definitely people who don't really understand what it feels like to feel rested. And we see that in a lot of disorders of people who are excessively sleepy that if you sort of adjust your baseline to meet where you're at, you don't really know. I tell people all the time, I don't think I'm missing out on being tall. Like that's never been something that I've really struggled with. I'm a short man. My Everybody in my family is much taller than I am, including my wife and my little kids who are now you know, a foot taller than I am. But I don't think that I'm missing out on anything. But if you made me tall for a month, magically, like I found some slipper that I put on my foot and made me, you know, six, six for a month, I may never want to go back. You know, like, mm -hmm. this is the best thing. People take me seriously. I can reach things on the highest shelf. Like, this is awesome. Like, so I think it's dangerous to make assumptions about things when you're kind of in the middle of it and you don't really... And that's one of the rewarding things about being a sleep physician is the patients we treat come back and say, I had no idea. I mean, I keep a little folder of letters I've gotten from parents and teachers, mm. you know, ever since this thing happened with this child, he or she is a different student. And one of my favorite things that was not put into the book was a, a young woman sent me a letter and a transcript from her college experience and she had annotated, this is where I met you. This is where you tried this treatment. This is where you did this. And all through the transcript, her grades just keep getting better and better to the point where she's making straight A's. And she said, I don't think I would have graduated had I not found you. And I would have always assumed that this thing that I was dealing with, which was a treatable sleep disorder, was just kind of how I'm built. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's really disappointing and sad. I think there's so many people who think that, you know, when I I'll do, you know, intake appointments with parents and kids and, you know, I'll ask a lot of questions about sleep. And, and I learned early on in my career that I had to get really specific because when you just say, well, you know, how does your child sleep? People will go, oh, you know, fine. Or even when you ask adults, like, how do you sleep? Oh, you know, I sleep. Okay. And then when you start getting into it and saying, well, tell me more about that. Like, how long does it take you to fall asleep? Do you stay asleep? How long do you sleep? Suddenly you're going, oh my gosh, you think this is fine, but actually I don't think you've had a decent night's sleep or your child hasn't had a decent night's sleep in their entire life. And there just isn't awareness around the fact that that's even happening. And it's strange for as much as we like to participate in things like sleeping or sex, yeah. We don't talk about it. Mm -mm. There's no sort of dialogue about that. So to your point, somebody sits down and starts telling you that they're a good sleeper, I guess. And then when you start asking questions, you're thinking to yourself, you're an awful sleeper, <laughs> but it's sort of, you don't really know because that's when you go to the dinner party, how's everybody sleeping lately? Right. You know, what's your efficiency? How, how long is it taking you all to fall asleep? Mine's gotten a lot better over the last, but like, you don't talk about that. It's you know, what your kids are doing and, you know, how your job is. And I, I don't know what you talk about, but nobody really talks about that. So, you know, culturally having dialogues like this, that people are interested in, hopefully kind of bleed into the culture where we start to kind of identify. I mean, if somebody said, oh, I'm doing just fine. I've just got blood coming out of my ear. It's no <laughs> yeah. big deal. Just yeah. a little bit. It's, you yeah. know, it just, it ruins a shirt a week. Like you would say, whoa, that's, that's so yeah. abnormal. You shouldn't, just accept that. Let's, let's take a look at that and figure out somebody who can help you with that. But the sleep thing, we've not gotten it to that level yet of, of people helping people recognize what might be outside of that bell curve distribution, I think. Yeah, I, I think it's true. I think it's true in our professional realms, as well as just in popular culture as well, which is why I'm so um, passionate about getting this information and having these conversations so that parents can be aware. Because to me, when we look at the hierarchy of interventions or things that we can use for kids who are having behavioral struggles, learning challenges, whatever it might be, sleep is the low hanging fruit where if we identify that there's a sleep problem or a sleep disorder going on and we can 
tangibly address that, it can often, as you mentioned, like completely change the trajectory of their symptoms of their life without banging our head against the wall, doing a whole bunch of other interventions that probably aren't going to get the best results because we didn't address this foundational piece of this is a child who is not getting enough good quality sleep at night. Yeah, I, I always thought about that, you know, during my neurology training, like neurologists are sort of notorious for thinking about things a lot, but not really doing much, you know, let's think about this stroke that we can't really help you with, but man, it's fascinating because it hit this one blood vessel and, and these nerves were affected, but not these, and it's all, we can map it out to this great, you know, we, so we mentally, you know, so to me, it was always like this big funnel. You think, 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 but it always comes down to about five different medications and three different interventional studies, MRI, CT, angiogram, uh, mm -hmm. some anti, you know, what anticonvulsants, some anti seizure, whatever. Like it, so it didn't matter what all happened down here. It was all about what are you going to do for this person? And sleep is something that you can do a lot for people. And like you said, it's usually pretty low down on the, on the, on the, you know, we don't, we don't have to open anybody up and stitch right. them back together. Like we, it, you know, these are things that are pretty accessible to people. And when you sort of map out, ease of intervention and potential benefit. It's like the best of both. It's, it's easy and can make massive improvements in terms of how, and then it also kind of lends itself to a more appropriate view that person has of themselves. I mean, one of the sad, so as somebody gets to treat adults and kids, we get to see the adult that didn't have their sleep problems managed properly when they were little and just how it not only just kind of festers in and of itself, but becomes kind of part of that person. Oh, I'm just, I'm just not good at school. Right. Why do you say that? Well, I, you know, I had to drop out my second year. I just was making terrible grades. Well, it looks like to me, you were making terrible grades because you couldn't stay awake during your classes. Not that you were a bad college student. So you, you've, you've kind of created this identity for yourself. That's not a true identity. You're an intelligent, capable person. You've got a disability though. Um, that makes it difficult for you to make it through a day like everybody else in the class and just be awake and take in information and remember it for a test. So it's it's always interesting to deal with adults and, and fix their problem and see this sort of identity crisis that kind of happens that, oh, I always thought I was this thing, but maybe I'm actually this other thing, which is which is really tragic sometimes. Absolutely. And I think that's such that highlights the importance of looking at and addressing these things when kids are young so that they yes. try to prevent them from having decades of their life spent thinking that they are just X, Y, or Z when in fact they have an undiagnosed, untreated sleep issue that that's impacting them. Um, I want to talk about you know, what, what are, what do you, we really mean when we say kids are having sleep problems? What, what's the sort of the difference between, well, just maybe a sleep issue that we don't need to be concerned about versus a sleep disorder. How prevalent are these things? Like when we look at all kids across the board, um, how often do kids have these issues? Let's kind of delve into some of that. So I'll go backwards. They're massively prevalent. Yeah. I mean, it's estimated that two out of three kids will have a sleep disorder by the time they go off to college or those years. Yeah. Um, so what that 66, 67% yeah. of people, let's cut it in half and say that's an overestimation. Um, we'll call it 33%. I mean, we consider obesity an, an epidemic and it's 18 to 19%. Um, I think uh, diabetes is 0.25%, depression, 4 to 5%, ADHD, 9 maybe 10%. So the scale of this problem is huge. And, and I don't think it's a big shock to people. I mean, I have three children. They don't have diabetes, um, but they've all struggled with their sleep at some point. I mean, I think it'd be strange to run into a parent of two kids who said, They've slept perfectly since they were born and have never had any struggles. Yeah. Like, wow. Like you are the outlier. It's not the person yeah. with the sleep problems. That's it's right. Or good for you. Don't talk a lot about it to your friends because they will hate you. So just keep that to yourself That's or right. make something up for God's sakes and, and move on. So they're very prevalent disorders. And, and, but the problem becomes 
there's not, I think used earlier before we started recording, used the word dark ages or a dark place, you know, in terms of our professions and sleep. And, 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 I, and I believe that deeply that there's not a lot of education about sleep. I mean, I was fascinated about sleep. I was doing sleep research when I was an undergrad. When I got to medical school, we got one lecture on sleep. Yeah. That was it. In four years, one lecture. So you think, okay, well, I guess sleep's not something we're going to really see as doctors. And when you look at adult doctors and kid doctors, they're some of the most common complaints that doctors see. I mean, for adults, two out of seven patients will have some sort of sleep problem, can't fall asleep or too sleepy during the day, they can't stay awake. And kids are absolutely no different. They just look differently sometimes. You know, kids don't do that thing where they're kind of nodding off in class all the time. They can actually look quite unsleepy. And, and I don't have to tell you as somebody who works in the mental health space, that's where kids sort of present, you know, in terms of it's a manifestations of anxiety or concentration problems or depression. And that can be mistakenly diagnosed as depression or kind of a real reactive depression. I want to go out with my friends. I want to go to, to see movies. I want to do well in school, but I am so sleepy that what I really want to do more than all that is go home and take a nap. And it's depressing. We're like, oh, you should have come yesterday. We watched the all the Matrix movies, one after the other. It was so much fun. Everybody came and you wanted to come. But in the moment you thought, oh, I really just too tired. I'm just going to take a nap. Yeah. And your grades are not good. And, and, and so it's amazing how we kind of turned our, turned our eye on that. And it's been estimated that, you know, pediatricians have uh, on average gotten about four hours of training on sleep in their programs with about a quarter of them never having any training. Yeah. So it, it does become, and in fact, I was doing a, a radio interview on Sirius XM with the head of pediatrics for a big East, East coast hospital. And he made some comment about melatonin. And I said, oh God, I said, if somebody says melatonin gummy bear, I'm going to leave this broadcast. <laughs> I made some joke about it. And he said, oh, he goes, oh, he goes, my, my residents aren't going to like to hear that. He said, that's pretty much their go-to for any sleep problem. I said, do you think they know what they're doing with it? He said, probably not, but it's harmless. You know, it's not going to hurt anybody. So you got a parent saying, my kid won't sleep, just melatonin gummy bear. So at least you've done something, even though you really haven't done much of anything. And maybe you've done harm in terms of you're putting ideas in somebody's head that you need chemicals to sleep mm -hmm. without really figuring out what, what's the problem. You know, what are we dealing with here? It's so true. And that mirrors, you know, my experience both personally with my own four kids, as well as professionally working with so many kids. And, and I find that when parents do bring sleep concerns up, usually it's around behavioral issues with sleep, right? Like my kid won't go to bed or whatever. And so they're given some, you know, basic parenting strategies around that. But the focus tends to be on, well, is your kid going to bed when you want them to and getting up as opposed to really digging into maybe your child is in bed for the right number of hours a night, but the quality of their sleep is terrible. Like those are the kinds of conversations that when I start digging into that and talking with parents about that, they're like, oh my gosh, nobody ever asked that, or I never thought about that, or I'm not sure. And, you know, sometimes we'll leave, I'll ask the kid a question during the session about, okay, so, you know, your parents are putting you to bed at 8 30 or nine, like how long before you fall asleep? And they'll be like, oh, you know, I'll look at the clock until it's like 11 or midnight, or they'll say, oh no, I'm up for three hours in the middle of the night. And the parents are going, what? Like I had no idea. And the kid just thinks, well, this is what it is. Like, this is always how I've slept. Like, is that a problem? Like, and, and so I think the importance of having this conversation around what does it mean for a kid to be getting good sleep? What do we want that to look like? And then how do we know when something has sort of veered off the path? So let's go to this piece of what should our kids sleep look like? And obviously there, you know, we can talk about little ones versus, you know, teens, young adults, but how do we know, like, what does it mean for our child to have good quality, restful sleep? Yeah. I mean, you bring up a lot of points there. I mean, people come to our clinic, not because they can't sleep. Mm -hmm. That doesn't exist in nature. That's not a, can't sleep is not a real thing. 
what they come is they come because their sleep is inefficient and unpredictable, either to themselves or to their parents. Yeah. You know, what's going to happen when you go to bed at night? If somebody asks me, I'm probably going to bed around 11, 1130. I want to fall asleep pretty quickly. And if I don't, I really don't care. It's not, that's not really a, so I like being in bed awake. It's lovely, in, in, frankly, in my, in my experience. So, you know, so a lot of times, like you said, it's some sort of expectation that we have of our kid. You know, and like you said, your kid goes to bed every night at 830 and it takes them two hours to fall asleep. How was 830 decided upon as the bedtime? Like, where did that come from? And it's amazing the looks you get like, I don't know, like, and to your point, a lot of times it's, well, dad or mom have got things to do at 830. So we need the kids to go to bed at 830 so we can have some time and do our own thing. So I think what quality sleep looks like is sleep that's kind of as memorable as brushing your teeth. You know, to me, if you said, you know, this is good brushing your teeth look like, I don't know, I just do it and I don't get cavities like it it's almost forgotten. And, and, and to me, that's what sleep should be like. It shouldn't be a huge topic of concern and consternation and stress and anxiety. It's how your kids sleep. I, I don't know. They, they, they go to bed and then when we check on, they're pretty much asleep and they're well-adjusted and doing well in their lives and healthy. Like that, that to me is kind of how it looks and you can get more detailed about it. You know, are they able to stay awake in class? How is their behavior and their school performance? Do you find them to be relatively easy to get along with? Or do they struggle with things like anxiety, depression, their attention? Um, you know, what, what are their nights like? Do they have unusual behaviors? They talk in their sleep, walk and go places when you wake them up and they destroyed their bed and they're turned all around. And the, you know, so I mean, there's all kinds of things to look for. And I think that that, you know, quality sleep basically is a time period that's not always eight hours that allows us to give our bodies the regeneration and the recovery that we need to do well the next day and into the future. Um, and there's all kinds of ways that we can monitor that. You can do, you know, sleep studies, but you know, all kinds of technology that people wear. It's, it's really opened up all kinds of windows. If you have the right question, meaning that my kid doesn't sleep well, so we bought him this thing and, and he's still not sleeping. well. <laughs> what did you think this was going That's to right. do? Like, you know, zap his brain. Yeah, zap and, you know, so, but, you know, so a lot of times when people have questions, you know, we spent a night in a hotel room with our son and he was just so restless. Mm -hmm. So we bought this and we realized that was kind of a, a one-off. I think the bed was hot or, you know, whatever, or, oh my gosh, his results are so different than the other kids who wore it for a couple of weeks. We think there's something going on. And He's not been feeling great. He's often very irritable. His grades have dropped a little bit. Like that's what we want to be on top of. Yeah, absolutely. So let's give people some clear things. Like what do you feel like are clear red flags? You sort of alluded to some of them, restlessness, those kinds of things. But for parents who are listening to this and realizing perhaps for the first time, like, wow, I think maybe my kid isn't sleeping well, like maybe sleep is a piece of all of the challenges that we're dealing with. What are some of those key things that they should be looking for kind of, you know, thinking about that would indicate that maybe my child does have a sleep disorder? Sure. So I, I think that at any point, you know, health, health issues, chronic health issues, my kid's always sick. My kid doesn't feel well. My kid gets a lot of headaches. Um, my kid is not growing. He was growing on that little growth chart at the pediatrician's office. And all of a sudden it's kind of dropping off that. I think any situation like that, it is fair game to say to the provider, what do you think about a sleep disorder that could be kind of hiding in there? You know, and I think the, the good provider would be like, that's a good thought. You know, I don't think a patient's ever brought something up to me that's within the realm of reality that I've been like, oh, no, no. like, you know, I've, I've got a headache. I'd like to get an MRI. Well, if you want to, we can talk about that, but if, if that would make you feel better. So I always think that we need to listen to parents when they have these ideas about stuff. You know, so to me, the other thing that you would look for is behavioral changes. That, that's a big one with kids. Um, defiance, irritability, fighting, arguing. I mean, kids do these kinds of things, I'm sure. Um, but a lot of times sleepiness can kind of really affect their ability to have patience and attend to things. Um, I, I think that school performance grades are another big indication that, that kids are struggling with their sleep. And then just listening to kids. I mean, 
a lot of kids have tremendous anxiety about their sleep. You know, the, the flip side, the, the wonderful thing about there being so much attention for sleep right now, you know, Tom Brady tweets out, sleep is the biggest part of me getting ready for a season. Or LeBron James says, I don't ever sleep less than eight hours. I believe in myself too much to ever sacrifice my sleep. I mean, these kind of luminaries are doing more work than I'll ever do in my career to sort of highlight the importance of sleep. And kids are paying attention to it. And so there is a bit of a performance anxiety that goes along with it. So if you've got a child who's saying, I'm struggling to fall asleep, or I wake up and I can't get back to sleep. Now, I talk a lot about this in the book, the way we deal with those problems is very important. I, I think that some of that is completely normal. It's like, how do you deal with your kid when he doesn't want to eat the second half of his sandwich you packed him for lunch? I, I don't think there's anything really to deal with right there. I don't, I don't necessarily consider that to be a medical problem. Now, every day he can't eat lunch and he doesn't eat much breakfast and he's losing weight. That's different. But you know, last Tuesday, for some reason, he didn't finish his sandwich. I, I wouldn't call the doctor about that. And so we have to give our kids a sense that sleep works. It's going to be there for you. But there is a natural variation that we've got something on your mind. It might take you a little while to fall asleep. And that's something that's a norm we want to embrace rather than be scared of. Because really at the root of a lot of kids sleep problems, which often are a result of sort of parent anxieties, is a fear. Yeah. There's something going on that we've got to deal with. Now, I think that it's important too that technology and pieces that we can control are controlled. So this idea that your kid can't sleep and the only thing that'll allow him to sleep is to play some Minecraft in his bed. I think we have to be a little bit better than that. But um, you know, I do think there's a lot of obstacles out. Hang on, Chris, I lost you. Oh, I lost sound here. Can you still hear me? Hmm. Let's see. Test, test. All right, you're back. I don't know what happened there. Weird little blip. Um, yeah. That's fine. We'll edit that. Um, let me let me ask you about some other specific things that parents might notice. So oh, you the, oh, just real, real oh, quick, yeah. one more thing. The other thing to be careful of is hypersomnolence. The kids who sleep great, they go to bed, they fall asleep in five seconds. They take wonderful naps. They fall asleep in school. Like the flip side that we never talk about in the media are people who are excessively sleepy because on the surface, they look like great sleepers. Yeah. You know, my son, it takes him an hour or two to fall asleep every night. He's always complaining about it. But my daughter, she's asleep before I hit it to the pillow. Mm -hmm. That can be healthy or that can actually be a sign that she's looking for more sleep than she can get. And so those are the ones that often hide in plain sight. So if you've got a child that you think seems sleepier than they should, comes home from school and takes a two hour nap, does a little bit of homework, eats something, goes right back to sleep, sleeps entire weekends away, nods off in school, pay attention to that. And, and, and sometimes schools are not particularly kind to those kids. You know, it's, it's viewed as sort of a flaw, you know, that they're doing, they're staying up late. They're not taking care of themselves. And so if you get any kind of reports of those kinds of things, I would definitely take those seriously. Great. And I think you made the important point that often fatigue or, you know, undersleeping looks um, very counterintuitive to us as adults, because we associate not getting enough sleep with being, with dragging, with being tired and actually in kids, that can look like wired, hyperactive, very, very active and busy. And so parents will say, well, it can't pot like they have way too much energy, but actually the opposite's true. And so I think that's so important that you raised that. I'm wondering about some red flags, things like um, snoring, for example, what is it, snoring or, you know, some signs of apnea, like what are some of those things that parents should be just kind of watching for? Yeah, you know, snoring is definitely a red flag, particularly in a kid. You know, kids' airways are young and sort of tight, and they don't have that sort of laxity that adults do. So kids can have some significant breathing disturbances, not really make a lot of noise. So a lot of times these things come about because you've shared a room with somebody at grandma's house or something, and everybody notices that, wow, he, you know, he or she really snores a lot. 
even not snoring a lot, but noticing that there seems to be little breathing interruptions that are causing little awakenings or little movements. Maybe your child's not even aware of it. Um, I think should be brought to the to to a doctor's attention. And there's very easy ways for us to look at the breathing of children and lots of easy interventions in terms of having kids who are struggling with their breathing. So sleep apnea, very common in adults, but definitely we see it in kids. Kids who move a lot or are restless, they sometimes will tell you that. Sometimes it presents as like growing pains. Mm -hmm. Mom, you, I need you to rub my legs before I go to bed every night. They'll have these kind of ritualized things like rubbing their legs or stretching their legs and where they want heaviness on their legs. You know, weighted blankets sometimes are very popular with these populations of people. Um, so there's a couple classifications, including a new one um, where kids just have more restless sleep than what's considered to be normal. Um, teeth grinding, acid reflux are two things that are very common. So kids who wake up with, you know, damaged teeth or bad breath, and when they go to the dentist, the dentist is saying, you look like you have some signs of, you know, teeth grinding or reflux, we might be want to be concerned about, you know, kids with big tonsils can interfere with those types of things as well, too. Nightmares, sleepwalking, sleep talking, sleep eating, you know, any kind of behavior is sort of fair game that if your kid's doing it at night, and either not having recollections of it or having recollection, recollections of it are very important clues as to what might be going on. And then, like I said, hypersomnia, excessively sleepy. A kid who falls asleep when his sister's opening presents on Christmas, you're thinking, wow, right? A major league baseball player's mother tell me, oh, when he was in high school, he would just sleep in the dugout between innings. Wow. And they would just wake him up to go back out in the field. And so it's in, not only is that fascinating, but the fact that did anybody think that, that was something that might want to be looked into? You know, so that, you know, sleep, sleep, it's not, it's not a seizure, you know, kind of thing. And that's sort of the attitude that a lot of people have about that. So anything that you're seeing that's sort of distressing like that, or you're noticing as a parent, again, just bring it up to your doctor, have it on people's radar that if this thing is not getting better and it seems to be going along with other struggles that more intervention could be you know, determined. That's great. And, you know, I, you, you were talking about the statistics, which actually are higher than I even thought, but it, it meshes with my clinical experience of, you know, two out of three kids having issues. And, you know, I think that I've read in research on this, but you can correct me that kids who have neurodevelopmental disorders, kids on the autism spectrum, kids with true um, ADHD, with those kinds of things, even within those populations, we see an even higher prevalence of disordered sleep. Is that, am I right about that? Absolutely. Yeah. And there's so many different mechanisms there. We see a lot of in individuals uh, with Down syndrome. Yeah. They have much larger tongues sometimes and much shortened um, palates. So their tongue can often obstruct breathing. So sleep apnea is very common in that population. Um, behavioral autism spectrum. These individuals often seem to require slightly less sleep than their you know, counterparts without or not on the spectrum, which is this sort of double whammy of these are sometimes very difficult kids to uh teach and parent during the day. So naturally the parent would be like, I just want a little bit of a break and have them asleep. And so that I can get caught up on some things I need to, because they demand so much of me. And it's difficult when those kids are getting up at 4 45 in the morning and demanding pancakes or whatever they want in the morning to have for yeah. breakfast. And you're like, how are you not sleeping enough? So I think that the medical you talk about dark, dark ages, the medical community is not equipped to deal with the sleep of your special needs child. And, you know, when I wrote the book, I mean, these are kids we see a lot. I really wanted to be very evidence-based, you know, obviously I have to put some experiences in there and I try to be very clear. This is what I think. And this is what science would say. There's so little science about these kids. It's like, they're not even worth investigating um, because the, you know, so it, it's, it's a very difficult space for parents to be in and trying to get good information about the sleep of their special young child. And it's just not existent. Yeah. And I think there's so many parents listening who can relate to that, who, you know, even raise these concerns only to be dismissed or, or to be told, yep, yeah, you know, give them some melatonin, give them a gummy, see if that helps. And, um, 
And it's so frustrating because the kids are struggling and the parents are struggling and it, we, we can and should be doing better by these kids and these families when it comes to a whole lot of things, but, you know, especially with what we're talking about with sleep. So I'd love to move into, okay, parents are now aware, like, huh, I never put the pieces together before. And I'm hearing you talking, like, I'm thinking that sleep is really something that we haven't looked at and, and need to for my child. Where, what's sort of the progression of how to look into that, right? So sure. bring the concern to the primary care, like, what, what should parents do if they are wondering about sleep in their kids? Yeah, so I, I've thought a lot about this. Um, I think what you said, and I'm glad you used the word a minute ago, dismissed. I'm not sure that there is any field of medicine um, that dismisses more people than things around sleep, um, both for adults and kids too. And I, I, I hate that. Um, anyway, oh, their soapbox. But you know, to me, in terms of what what you do is, I think that I, the, the the dismissive word is important because depending upon the relationship that you have with your your primary care provider, your child's primary care provider, you know, this could be a real positive. I mean, I, I can think about the referral region that I'm in, just the the absolute all star pediatricians and primary care doctors that they're thinking about stuff about sleep that probably I, I might not <laughs> like, like, Oh, this kid doesn't have sleep problems. You've realized, Oh, they did. Wow. That was so good of, you know, I think of Dr. Dr. Smythe. This is why I'll give her a shout out. She's in my room. She is on top of the sleep of her kids. Awesome. You know, I have no idea what she's like as a person or as a business <laughs> manager, as a pediatrician, but by God, if you've got a sleep problem in her clinic, she's going to sniff it out. And, you know, I always tell providers when I lecture to other doctors or pediatricians, if every kid that you send off has a sleep problem, you're missing a ton, mm -hmm. you know, so don't be afraid to send somebody off for an evaluation, have it come back and say, no, their, their sleep's wonderful. It's a great thing for a parent to know that, hey, your kid, I'm not sure what's going on while your kid's so fatigued during the day, but their sleep's gorgeous. So to me, I think it does start with your primary care doctor. And then if it's the pat on the head, you know, every kid wets the bed, which in your recess drives me crazy too. Like at what point do we get to say, okay, my kid's in calculus. He's still right. wetting the bed. Can yeah. we do something about it now? You know, yeah. so at what point? Can we not be sort of dismissive? You know, it's fine to look at it. Okay, well, we'll keep it on the, the record here. And then in three months from now, if you still feel like there's a problem, we're going to get, we're going to address it. You know, if that's okay with you as a parent, that's fine. I mean, I ask patients all the time. I don't think you need a sleep study. Do you want one? I don't want to dismiss. If you dis are certain that your kid needs a sleep study, we can do it. Um, it may not be the, 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 the step that I would take at this point, but you know, I want to make sure I'm listening to the parent as well, too. And we're doing things that are not only appropriate, but are sort of meeting with their expectations. If you feel like you're always being dismissed about that or nothing's being done, I think you just do it yourself. You say, hey, you know, I appreciate you not wanting to do that right now, but I'd really like to see a sleep specialist. And I know we have a great one, you know, across town. Would you mind setting up a referral for that? I think if a doctor says no, I'd get another doctor not to be too yeah. blunt about it. I mean, it's like, a, it's like a patient who says, I demand an MRI. I'm not going out on a limb to say no to a brain MRI because I have been wrong before right. where the MRI comes back. You're like, Oh, there's, this isn't a normal MRI. Mm -hmm. So I, I can tell you, I don't think the odds are that it's going to be, but it, it, at the end of the day, it's your life. It's your body. It's your health. And we should be supporting these things as long as you understand the risks and benefits of the things we talk about. So to me, asking for a sleep referral when you've got a concern about your child is like, you know, I'll use your phrase, it's low hanging fruit. And why would a doctor argue against that? That doesn't make any sense, but I hear it all the time. I, 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 guess see, yeah. I had to fight for this yes. referral. Yeah. I, I see that all the time and having to step in on behalf of families and use the letters behind my name to, you know, demand that it happen or make the referral, um, you know, myself. And it, it's just really frustrating because, yeah, I mean, if a parent's concerned about it and the child's exhibiting symptoms, even if you don't think that sleep is the problem, why not? check the box right. and say, Absolutely. we've looked at it. This isn't the issue. Now we can move on to the 18 other things that might be going on. Right. So, yeah. and, I, and in my book, I put a, I put a cause of fatigue for every letter of the alphabet. 
So we've ruled out sleep. I mean, yeah. I tell people all the time, I've never done a sleep study or done a sleep evaluation that I regretted. Yeah. Because it the, it's going to either show something that we can maybe fix or it's going to be normal, which is a box check. And I'm sure with mental health, it's 10 times worse, but you know, it's so dis- you know, you've got a kid who's interested in talking to somebody about their sleep. The parents are interested and there shouldn't be a lot of roadblocks to that. So they should ask for, so if the, if the physician, if the primary care provider doesn't initiate saying, oh, yeah, let's get this going. And the parent is in the situation of needing to request it themselves. You're saying request to be referred to a sleep specialist. Yeah. Just have yeah. you talk for a moment about who are sleep specialists. Is there a certain, are there a pediatric one? Just to give people an idea yeah. of who are they looking for to see? Yeah. So th- this is really a great thread of conversation. Um, because that can mean a lot of things. And, and so to me, um, that, that specialist can be, a, be, be one of many things. And I talk about this sort of at the end of the book. Generally, what we're talking about are MDs or in some cases, PhDs that have some special designation in sleep. So a lot of people are surprised to find out that you know, there is a medical, like you can be a knee surgeon, you could be somebody who does reconstructive breast surgeries, or you could be a sleep doctor. These are all pathways once you walk out of medical school. Uh, one of my mentors, Don Blywise at Emory was a PhD. So he was not an MD, but you know, so, and that comes with, well, can they prescribe things? And that's all state specific. It, we, we all work together. It's not that big of a deal, but you do want somebody with sort of a specialized training there. And you can sometimes run into some difficulties in terms of, you know, sleep coaches, sleep experts, sleep specialists, they, they mean a lot of different things. And I'm sure there's people out there who've read a lot of books about sleep who probably know more than I do, who have no degree behind their name. But when you're dealing with your kid and trying to get care for them related to a sleep problem, you probably want some sort of clinical sleep specialist with, you know, like you said, letters at the end of their name. So in the United States, there's the American Board of Sleep Medicine is now defunct, but there's a lot of older doctors who have that designation, which is perfectly fine. I actually have it because I got that designation as it was going out and the new board was coming in, which is the whole reason for the double, the double board certified sleep doctor is kind of a joke, but it sounds very fancy. It sounds great, doesn't it? Yes, it's double. <laughs> so I, I always joke with my colleagues that I really take good care of my body and my health because I want to outlive them all and be the only double board certified sleep doctor at some point when I'm like 82 years old. <laughs> I love It'll be it. me and this other woman. And we're going to wait around to see who dies know, first. Who goes yeah. first? The last of the double board certified, right. you know. Life goals. Uh, but, but, you know, but this can be a neurologist, which I am. They can yeah. be pulmonary doctors, pediatricians, psychiatrists. Mm-hmm. So there's lots. And we all do things well and not. So I'm decent at the neurology stuff, but maybe monitoring like a complicated CPAP for a ventilator kind of situation might be a better pulmonary thing. If your right. child has a lot of asthma and a lot of coughing at night that keeps them up, you know, a pediatric pulmonary sleep doctor could be awesome for your, for your child. So to me, you know, there's a lot of us out there. Um, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine has a list. You can look up your state right. or your city and see who are the board certified doctors in your area, what their specialties are. Um, and you may need to go in there sort of equipped with that information. I mean, I can promise you, if you read my book, you'll probably know more about pediatric sleep than the doctor you're talking about. That's not a knock on them. It's just that they, they can't know everything about everything. And, and sleep, like you said, it's just kind of low down sometimes on, on the list there. So you may have to fight a little bit for it, but those resources are definitely out there. And once someone gets to a sleep specialist, just to give a little bit of a sense of, you know, I think sometimes people think that the um, response is going to be, well, we'll do some sort of, you know, sleep study or, well, we'll take some medication. I, I want to give people a sense of the breadth and depth of options and yep. things, because I think sometimes people make assumptions about what's going to be recommended or what the scope of options is. And really there's so many things that we can look at and do. Absolutely. That's a great question. So first and foremost, seeing a sleep specialist does not necessarily mean you're going to have a sleep study. And if you don't want a sleep study or your kid doesn't want a sleep study, you're not going to have one. And this is always going to be your choice. To me, the bread and butter of seeing a sleep specialist is sitting down with them 
and spending that half hour diving into their sleep. Um, and I don't, I think it's perfectly fine for a pediatrician not to want to deal with sleep as long as he or she has a plan for the people that they think have a sleep problem. So listen, I, I'm not a sleep specialist. I have to see a patient every seven minutes to keep the lights on around here. I'm just going to send you to Chris. Great. I'd actually prefer that. Yeah. You don't want me delivering your babies. I don't want you dealing with the sleep of our patients. Like, well, you do your thing. I'll do my thing. And I think patients will benefit from it. So sleep studies are fine. They're often necessary to figure certain things out about sleep. They're generally very easy studies. Kids usually like them. Um, but there is a lot of anxiety about them. So one of the questions I always ask patients, if we're kind of going down that pathway of thinking a sleep study might be necessary as a way to actually critically evaluate sleep and see what might be wrong with it. Why does your child wake up? Why does your child wet the bed every night? There might be something going on there. If a parent says, you know, you've described to me coming into this Hilton hotel, which is where our sleep center is and a technician taping some little wires to my child's head, I think my kid would freak out and he would just not like that. Then, then we, we work around that. Yeah. Like, and, and maybe, well, this is maybe not the time to do that. So to me, parents have a tremendous amount of influence there, but most kids who do it are just lovely. And we have texts that are really good with kids and they hook their stuffed animals up for the sleep study too. And you know, all that good stuff. And, and so I think that, you know, all these things are, are sort of on the table. And then to your point, medications are too, but I always find that it's important for individuals to understand, not just in sleep medicine, but in medicine in general, you're taking four medications. What are they doing? Yep. And the answer, this is for sleep is not an answer. Mm -hmm. This is like saying, this is for heart. Well, what do you mean heart? Like you've got heart failure or you have high blood pressure or you are prone to have heart attack, angina symptoms, and you take some night... Like, so we always want to be clear about we're giving your child this medication because he is moving his legs four to 700 times a night, which is not intrinsically dangerous in any way, but every time he moves his leg, his brain wakes up. And that's why he is so tired and irritable during the day. Let's try the medication for a period of time, see if it works. If it does, great. If it doesn't, we'll do something else. Narcolepsy, you know, a condition where you're so sleepy during the day. I mean, these medications change lives every day. I mean, parents say things like, you've given me my son back. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll literally break down talking about it. I mean, I'm getting chills thinking about some of the stories we've had. Or a father will break down and say, I have been so hard on my son because I just felt like he was lazy. I had no idea this was a medical condition. Like, I'm just a terrible person for doing this. I mean, so but they're not. I mean, this, right. we all learn these things together. So those medications can be absolutely life-changing. If your kid has a breathing disturbance, some sort of surgery, a little oral appliance, like a retainer, or in some cases, a CPAP, like an adult might wear, can allow them to breathe properly and not wake up because they're suffocating all through the night. And a lot of those things are temporary. Mm -hmm. You know, Several years down the line, they may not need that anymore based upon some interventions or just natural growth. So there's all kinds of things that can be done, but we always want a parent to walk out or parents to walk out understanding exactly what it is that's wrong with their child's sleep and not some sort of generic, well, my kid can't sleep, so he takes melatonin gummy bears at night. Yeah. Yeah. And I think something a lot more you know, <laughs> specific and real. Yes, for sure. And I think, you know, even in the realm of, um, you know, education about sleep hygiene, the role of screens mm -hmm. and that like all of those things are things that people within your specialty area are exploring and talking about. And so just for parents to understand that sometimes you know, it's, it's pretty basic stuff that can make, you know, a big difference. And by seeing a sleep specialist, all of those things are going to be explored and, um, you know, you're going to get education and help around. And kids pay attention to it too. I mean, I always tell parents, you know, when I'm speaking, I'm not, a, I'm not, it's okay for me to be the bad guy. I mean, right. some of the times you're getting the technology out of a kid's room is tough, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a, it, it is tough for us. I mean, it's not just those parents. I, I, I find it too. So it's okay. So most, you know, kids it's, you know, when they're talking to the sleep doctor or the, you know, the sleep doctor with the Los Angeles Dodgers world series sign thing on the wall, it's like, oh my gosh, you, 
yeah, I, I take care of their sleep. And a lot of those guys have a lot of trouble with technology because they go out there and pitch badly and the entire world has something to say about it. So you're not the only one who, so we, we can sometimes help it. I'm always amazed by the, by how kids respond to seeing the sleep doctor sometimes. And, and I remember one time a little girl, she came in because she would always get middle of the night and wake her parents up every night. And I just asked, you know, why do you do that? And she just kind of looked at me and he's like, I don't, I don't know. I'm like, don't you think it's kind of hard on your parents? I mean, do you think they can do anything about the fact that you've woken up and now you've woken them up and they're ear? And she started to cry a little bit. Uh, but it was just interesting that nobody had ever really engaged with her about it outside of stop doing this, right. you know, and, 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 and the parents were kind of behind her, like, oh my gosh, like she's really listening and talking about this. Cause we can't really, and, and things got better very quickly, but you know, so a lot of times it's not lost on the kids that they're seeing a sleep specialist and they're having some of their problems validate, like when they see you. And you can say, listen, you're not the only one who's struggling with anxiety right now. I am. Yep, right. Everybody I know is. Yeah. And everybody you go to school with is too, whether they're talking to you about it or not. So yeah. this is not unusual. I mean, do you know how many adults wet the bed? Right. You, know, you yeah. wet the bed. It's not that big a deal. I mean, we've, if you're trying to impress me with bedwetting, it's not going to happen around here. Like we <laughs> see it all the time. You are not alone. So, I mean, I think sometimes kind of validating what's going on with them makes them feel better that somebody really has some sort of degree of expertise that might be able to help them. It's comforting. Yeah. And for parents too, for sure. Um, there are so many more things that we could talk about around this, but um, we're going to have to wrap up and there's so much more that is addressed and answered in the book. So I want to make sure that we tell people where they can find out more about you and the work you're doing and about the book, because I really want every person listening to this to get this book. Sure, that's kind of you. So you can find the book wherever books are sold on Amazon. It's The Rested Child, While You're Tired, Wired, or Irritable Child May Have a Sleep Disorder and How to Help. So it's, it's out in hardback now, uh, Kindle and Audible. Um, my previous book, The Sleep Solution, is available in the same place. I do have a web page. It's uh, wchriswinter.com. Uh, um, and then my Twitter and Instagram, which I really try to put good sleep content on those platforms, is uh, Dr. Chris Winter on, on both of those things. So uh, find me, uh, DM me, um, tell me what's going on with your kid's sleep, and um, we'll, we'll figure out what we can do about it. Awesome. And you do put great content out, and we'll put all of those links in the show notes so that uh, people can access those. Really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to have this conversation today to share what really um, can be just life-changing information for kids and families. And um, so very much appreciate you being here. Oh, Nicole, I appreciate your platform and your your planning. You clearly thought a lot about what you were going to talk about today because I'm, I'm sure you probably see it all the time. So I really pre appreciate your time and um, getting the word out. I think it's a, it's an important book. I think the world could have lived without my first book. I was, <laughs> but this book kind of didn't really exist. In fact, when I was talking to my publisher about it, they were like, oh, another book about kids and sleep. I'm like, what are you talking about? They're not, I said, you talking about how to get your baby to sleep through the night. I said, that's not really a book about kids and sleep. Like that's when you, when your kid graduates away from clothing that snaps in the crotch, your sleep problems are just starting. <laughs> like they're not, well, we're done. We got them on a nap schedule. So we're going to just take the next 18 years off and, and celebrate. Like it's, yeah, that's where the real stuff begins, I think. So I, uh, I agree. This is for the rest of those years for sure. So thank you again. And thanks as always to all of you for being here, for listening, for being part of this community. Look forward to catching you back here next time.